Today we're looking at the most expensive card from and during every single year of Magic the Gathering. 1993, then Black Lotus from Alpha, $25. Now, Black Lotus from Alpha, $540,000. Not only is Black Lotus the most expensive Magic the Gathering card from 1993, it's also the most expensive Magic card of all time, or at least it was, until the one of one the one ring came out a few months ago. So why is Black Lotus so expensive? Not only is it considered to be one of, if not the strongest card in the game, but it's also among the rarest. The Alpha set had an incredibly small print run, so only around 1,100 copies of Black Lotus were printed back in 1993, and at the time no one expected the game of magic to still be around and thriving 30 years later, so many of those copies have likely been lost to time. Exactly how many of those 1100 still exist today is anyone's guess. Figuring out the exact value of an Alpha Black Lotus is actually pretty tricky because it depends so heavily on condition. A graded 10 copy recently sold for a record setting $540,000, although we also know that Post Malone paid $800,000 for an artist proof signed copy. What is the highest amount of money you ever paid for a Magic the Gathering card? $800,000. $800,000. It was an artist print, Chris Rush signed Black Lotus. While a beat up copy of Black Lotus is gonna sell for less, it'll still be tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. So Black Lotus is the most expensive card from 1993 today, but what was the most expensive card back in 1993? Well, technically it's still Black Lotus, although hilariously it was essentially tied with Shivan Dragon, with both cards costing right around $25 at the time. Today you can get copies of Shivan Dragon for for a few cents. In fact, a couple of years ago, Wizards literally gave them away for free to new players in intro decks given away through local game stores. But back in 1993, a Black Lotus for a Shivan Dragon was actually considered to be a fair trade. 1994, then Mirror Universe from Legends, $70. Now, the Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale, Legends, $4,400. By 1994, the print run on Magic sets had started to increase. While there were only 1,100 Alpha Black Lotuses printed in 1993, by 1994, the most valuable card, the Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale from Legends, had 19,300 copies printed, a nearly 20-fold increase in just one year's time. Still, compared to the print run of recent sets, this is a pretty tiny amount, which is why the Legendary Land will still set you back more than $4,000. Well, that and the fact that it absolutely wrecks creature decks by making everyone pay a one mana tax for each creature each turn or else sacrifice them, which keeps the land relevant in decks like Lands and Legacy. While the Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale was expensive back in the day as well, issue 9 of Scry Magazine from October 1995 had it listed at $25. It wasn't even the most expensive card from the Legends set. That title belongs to Mirror Universe. Universe, which cost a whopping $70. Why Mirror Universe was so expensive, I have literally no idea. Today, life swapping cards are considered to be janky and playable against the odds cards. Magic in 1994 was super weird. Wanna swap life totals with your opponent? Well, you could snag all the cards you need from our sponsor, Card Kingdom, over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. 1995, then Jester's Cap from Ice Age, $25. Now, Necropotence from Ice Age, $30. Banned in Legacy and a staple in Commander, thanks to its ability to draw a huge number of cards, Necropotence was infamously underrated when it was first released. Today, it is pretty well known that trading life for cards is super worth it. But back in 1995, Magic Theory was in its infancy and players weren't convinced that trading one life for one card was actually worth it, so they weren't nearly as high on Necro, which its 1995 price of just $6 backs up. At the time, players were much more excited for another Ice Age wear in Jester's Cap, thanks to the artifact's ability to disrupt opponents' combos by exiling their combo pieces from their deck, which pushed its price up to $25, making it the most expensive card of the year back in 1995. A quick honorable mention to Mana Crypt. It doesn't 
technically qualify for our list today because it wasn't printed in a regular magic set. Instead, it was a promo given out in a magic book printed by Harper Prism. Actually, there were five cards printed this way, although all of them except for Mana Crypt were super underpowered. The idea was pretty simple. Buy the book and you get a Mana Crypt for free. Today, nearly 30 years later, this ended up being a pretty absurd deal since Mana Crypt is banned in most competitive formats and considered to be one of the strongest cards in Commander, with a single copy of the original book promo setting you back around $320. 1996, then Belduvian Horde, Alliances, $20, now Lion's Eye Diamond, Mirage, $470. Lion's Eye Diamond was infamously ranked to be one of the worst cards in Mirage when it was first printed, although in all honesty this does make some sense because Lion's Eye Diamond really wasn't great when it first came out. The pieces simply didn't exist to make a Black Lotus that made you discard your hand actually work, although in the years since many combos have been printed which turned Lion's Eye Diamond from bust to broken. Remember our video about the fastest bannings in Magic's history? You can argue that it was really the the fast mana from Lion's Eye Diamond that led to Underworld Breach being banned in Legacy so quickly. Without LED, the combo wouldn't even exist. On the other hand, 1996 players loved Belduvian Horde, pushing its price up to $20, making it the most expensive card of the year. A 5 5 for just 4 mana, even with the drawback of needing to discard a card to play it, was considered to be super above the curve at the time, although the trajectory of Belduvian Horde was essentially the opposite of Lion's Eye Diamond, it was super overrated when it first released and players realized it wasn't nearly as good as they thought it would be. An honorable mention goes out to Hammer of Bogarden, which was $16 back in 1995. The expensive but repeatable lightning bolt ended up being immortalized as a finisher on those old MTG on MTV ads. It's a tournament of magic today at Motel California. Magic the Gathering, the strategic card game where two players duel against each other by using their cards to cast spells and summon creatures. That's Hammer. His opponents say he's psychic. He watches for patterns that people fall into. By the time he plays you, he knows what you're thinking and what you're going to do better than you do. Bolt you, seeker you, Hammer. Exile. Yeah. 1997. Then, Time Warp from Tempest, $17. Now, Intuition from Tempest, $165. Today, Intuition is mostly known for assembling combos in CEDH and in Legacy, which combined with the reserve list, a list of cards that Wizards has promised they would never reprint, which included Intuition and many other powerful cards from the first decade of Magic, has led to Intuition climbing all the way up to $165 from its $5.1997 price tag. At the time, it was another Tempest rare, Time Warp that topped the price charts at $17. It turns out that you can take a Power 9 card, in this case Time Walk, more than double its mana cost and you still end up with a super powerful card, to the point where Time Warp was recently banned in Magic Arena nearly 25 years after it was first printed. 1998. Then, Morphling from Urza Saga, $30. Now, Gaia's Cradle from Urza Saga, $880. Urza's block was the last block where wizards maintained the reserve list, the promise not to reprint certain cards again ever. As a result, Gaia's Cradle, a stapling go-wide creature decks like Elves and Legacy and Commander, has slowly but surely climbed from $20 back in 1998 to nearly $1,000 today. While Gaia's Cradle was considered to be quite strong back when it was first printed, another Urza Saga rare was even stronger. Morphling. Considered to be the best creature ever printed when it first released, Superman was the most expensive card of 1998 at $30, which is doubly impressive considering it happened during Combo Winter, one of the most broken eras of magic. While Morphling was jaw-dropping at the time, eventually it would get wrecked by a rules change where wizards removed damage from the stack, which would greatly diminish its power and eventually its price. 1999, then multi Tani Mero Sorcerer from Urza's Legacy, $12. Now, Imperial Seal from Portal Three Kingdoms, $1,000. 
The portal sets are weird. Technically, all three of them were regular booster sets, so they qualify for our list, but they were designed for the Asian market, and Wizards greatly underprinted the sets, especially the last one, Portal 3 Kingdoms, which is why cards like Imperial Seal cost a massive $1,000 today. Even though they really only see fringe play, they're just super scarce and hard to find. While Imperial Seal is really pricey today, at the time it was fairly cheap because Wizards declared that the portal sets were illegal for tournament play. It wasn't until 2005 that Wizards changed their mind and made all three portal sets legal in Vintage and Legacy, and then the prices of those cards started to climb. So what was the most expensive card from 1998 back in 1998? According to issue 41 of the Duelist, it was a tie between two Urza's Legacy cards, both of which cost $12. The first was Multani Marrow Sorcerer, which makes some some sense. Assuming you can keep a handful of cards, it's a massive creature that's impossible to kill with targeted removal. In an era where creatures were pretty bad, even something like Multani, which is expensive and risky, looked pretty good. The second card doesn't make nearly as much sense. Second chance. Apparently early magic players were so high on extra turn spells that even one that was restricted as an enchantment that only works if you happen to have five or less life on your upkeep was worthy of hype. Hilariously, today's second chance is only worth $5, even though it's on the reserve list and can never be reprinted. 2000, then Urza's Rage from Invasion $30. Now, Ristic Study from Prophecy, $37. Do you want to know the best investment you could have possibly made during the new millennium? It's not the stock market, or Amazon, or gold, or Bitcoin, or even Black Lotus. It's Ristic Study. You know when you go to a draft event at your local game store and some people leave behind their extra cards, the random commons, the draft chaff once the event ends? That was Ristic Study back in 2000. If you look back in old price guides, you'll see Ristic Study listed for 25 cents. Although it's worth mentioning that 25 cents is the floor for card prices. No card is listed for less than that. So I think we can honestly say that back in 2000, Ristic Study was literally the cheapest card in the game of Magic, or at least tied for cheapest. To put its explosive price growth into perspective, let's say you invested $100 in Ristic Studies at $0.25 cents a piece back in the year 2000. At its peak price of around $60, your $100 would have been worth almost $25,000. And even at today's price of $37 after multiple reprintings, your $100 would still be closer to fifteen dollars not bad for some common draft jaff. So what was the most expensive card back in the year 2000? As far as I can tell, it was the Invasion Rare Urza's Rage. The kicker mechanic allowed Urza's Rage to be an uncounterable removal spell in the early game, and then an uncounterable 10 damage finisher in the late game, which turned the card into a standard staple which showed up across archetypes and everything from aggro decks like fires to a bunch of control builds, and this spiked the price of the card up to a massive $30, which is especially Especially hilarious today, considering a few years ago, Wizards brought Urza's Rage to Modern for the first time in Modern Horizons, except instead of being a $30 chase rare, it was a random uncommon that goes unplayed and costs just 24 cents today. 2001, then Spirit Monger from Apocalypse, $8. Now, Deserted Temple from Odyssey, $26. Deserted Temple is another card that wasn't especially expensive when it first released. You could grab copies for $2 back in 2001, but it ended up getting super pricey once Commander became a popular format thanks to its ability to untap lands like Cabal Coffers and Nykthos Shrine to Nyx to make an absurd amount of mana. As far as cards that were expensive back in 2001, we actually have a tie between two very different cards. One is Spirit Monger with a 5 mana 6 6 with upside being very far above the curve two decades ago, and the second is Traumatize. While many things have changed in Magic over the past 22 years, one thing that has stayed the same is players loving random janky mill spells way more than they probably should, which often leads to these spells being oddly expensive, even though the mill arc type is rarely competitive. 2002, then Exalted Angel from Onslaught, $20. 
Now, polluted Delta from Onslaught, $90. A member of the most playable and arguably most powerful land cycle ever printed, the Fetch Lands, polluted Delta has been a staple from the minute it was printed. Today, thanks to an absurd amount of demand from modern legacy vintage and commander players, a single copy will set you back $90. Back in 2002, Polluter Delta cost around 11 bucks, which was still a lot for a single card two decades ago, although not nearly as much as the most expensive card of the year, Exalted Angel, which cost $20. Exalted Angel was basically the original Baneslayer Angel, a massive life-flinking flyer that would be Agrodex all by itself, and it was even better at the time since you could play it face down as a morph and then flip it face up with the help of Astral Side, a game plan that led to one of the most iconic standard decks of its era. 2003, then Chrome Box from Mirrodin, $22. Now, Sliver Overlord from Scourge, $75. Magic players love slivers. They loved them back in 2003 and they love them in 2023. Actually, outside of a brief window right after Core Set 2014 released and Wizards changed the iconic meat hooks into more humanoid looking slivers, which made everyone hate the tribe for a while until Wizards eventually fixed it and brought back the original version. Slivers have been among the game's most popular tribe for most of the game's history. While Sliver Overlord is a massive $75 today, in part because of players upgrading their new Commander Masters Precon decks. Even back in 2003, Sliver Overlord was a fairly pricey card at nearly 12 bucks, although this pales in comparison to the most expensive card of the year in Muradin's Chrome Mox. No matter how many restrictions you add to a Mox, a zero mana artifact that adds a mana is pretty broken. Sure, unlike the original Mox in which had zero downside, Chrome Mox requires you to exile a card from your hand to actually make mana, but that doesn't really matter. Better. The card is still so strong, it's banned in modern and a staple in CDH and in Legacy. 2004, then Cranial Extraction from Champions of Kamigawa, $20. Now, Sword of Fire and Ice from Darksteel at $47. Sword of Fire and Ice is one of those rare cards that is beloved by pretty much everyone. Casual players love it in their commander equipment decks, while Spikes will tutor up with Stoneforge Mystic in various formats, which is why the iconic equipment is still $47 despite being reprinted a bunch of times. Back in 2004, it cost $14, which did put it among the handful of most expensive cards of the year at the time. Although it was being out by Champions of Kamigawa Rare Cranial Extraction, which cost $20. Remember how Jester's Cap was the most expensive card back in 1995 because it allowed players to exile combo pieces from their opponent's deck? Cranial Extraction served a similar purpose. You can name whatever your opponent's most important card is and get rid of all the copies of it forever, which made it an all-store sideboard card in constructed formats. Today, Cranial Extraction sees zero play because it's been power crept out of the game, although we still see the influence of Cranial Extraction in more recent designs like Slaughter Games, Necromancia, and Unmore Ego. 2005, then Pithy Needle from Saviors of Kamigawa, $30. Now, Doubling Season from Ravnica, $75. It's a story as old as time. Wizards prints a random casual card. It isn't especially expensive when it first releases. Doubling season was just four bucks back in 2005. But then Commander becomes a behemoth and the price shoots to the moon. Doubling season is another one of those cards. But back in 2005, Standard was the king and the prices of the most expensive cards of the year reflect that. Honestly, I was expecting Umazawa's Jitte to be the most expensive card of the year, considering Considering how broken and heavily played it was in standard at the time, and while it was expensive, the equipment was somewhere between $15 and $20, it was actually in a pre-con deck back in 2005, which helped keep its supply high and its price under control. On the other hand, 2005 was the first time that 
pithy needle was printed, and everyone needs the artifact in their sideboards, leading to the price shooting up to $30. This actually makes a lot of sense. Pithy needle still sees play in multiple formats today, almost 20 years later, one of the rare cards from its era that hasn't been lost to the sea of power creep. 2006, then Hallowed Fountain from Dissension, $20. Now, Gemstone Caverns from Time Spiral, $50. 2006 was the year of the lands. The current most expensive card is Gemstone Caverns, although this is a relatively recent development. Back in 2014, the rare lion cost just $1 and was essentially unplayed, but over the past decade, Wizards has banned pretty much all the fast mana out of modern, which has made gemstone caverns an unlikely stable in decks looking to combo as quickly as possible. Since all the better fast mana options are banned, gemstone caverns shows up by default and now costs 50 bucks. Back in 2006 though, it was another land cycle, which was all the rage, the Shocklands from Ravnica block. Back during their life in standard, the Shocklands were around $20, which is a ton for a land, especially considering that just a few years before, the original fetch lands were printed at Onslaught, and they were only around $10 while in standard. The Shocklands are staples in literally every format, from modern back through commander, and you can stack copies for around $11 today, although this isn't because the lands are bad or that they've been power crapped out of the game by better options, it's because Wizards reprints them constantly to help keep the prices in line. 2007, then Tarmogoy from Future Sight, $50. Now, Sliver Legion from Future Sight, $57. Much like Sliver Overlord from a few years before, Sliver Legion, the most expensive current card from 2007, is pricey thanks to the casual popularity of the Sliver Tribe. Much more interesting is the story of the most expensive card back in 2007, Tarmogoyf. When Tarmogoyf was first previewed, it was something like $2. Players just weren't that impressed with Tarmogoyf, with some saying they thought it might see playing Dredge or self mill decks, but it wasn't that good. A couple of weeks later, it shot up to 50 bucks as players realized it was the best to drop in essentially any deck that had green mana. Over the next few years, Tarmogoyf would climb all the way up to over $200, making it the most expensive card in the modern format, to the point where it was iconically rare drafted during the top eight of GP Vegas back in 2015. There's a lot of good equipment floating around. Whoa! Oh. Opened a foil <laughs> Oh, what do you do? That is the question, Pascal Vaynar. <laughs> that is the question. It. Foil Tarmogoyf. Pascal ends up taking the foil Tarmogoyf. 2008, then Reflecting Pool from Shadowmoor, $30. Now, Painter's Servant from Shadowmoor, $62. Painter Servant is a good example of what happens when Wizards refuses to reprint a card. Painter Servant does see a bit of play in Legacy as a combo piece with Grindstone and some fringe CDH play, but in reality you're not all that likely to see a Painter Servant show up in an actual game of Magic, but it's still a massive $62 because it's 15 years old and discounting a Kaladesh Invention reprint, which doesn't really count, it's never been reprinted. Back in 2008, Painter Servant was mostly a bulk rare, but Reflecting Pool on the other hand cost $30 is one of the best mana fixing lands of its era, finding a home in the iconic five color cruel control deck, which is famously known for creating one of the greatest moments in the history of magic, Nasif's called shot with cruel ultimatum. All right, Nasif needs to draw threats. Ooh, thought sees. Sees nothing. Sees reflecting pool. Yeah, Gabriel and the C playing off the top of the deck. That's what we talked about. This is our Sandy Jones' plan. Get some threats. Top decker, no. The C forced to play off the top of his deck. He's going to slow roll all of us, himself included. He's drawn the card face down in front of him, and he hasn't even looked at it yet. He's trying to figure out what can it be. What do I need it to be? Arrange my lands. He's got a sort of sly smile on his face. Bring my ultimatum mana. Oh, <laughs> this is ultimatum mana. That's the card that he wants. 
Cruel Ultimatum is the card he's hoping to top deck. And... Oh! Oh! My oh my God! God! Made him! Off the top! Wow! 2009, then, Bane Slayer Angel from Corset 2010, $50. Now, Mindbreak Trap from Zendikar, $46. Today, Mind Break Trap, mostly a sideboard hate card to defeat Storm style combo decks, is the most expensive card from 2009 at $46, but at the time, it was Bane Slayer Angel and it wasn't even close. The Mythic Angel quickly shot up to $50, which gained it the nickname the Wallet Slayer, much to the chagrin of standard players everywhere. The reason why Bane Slayer Angel is so expensive is notable. Yes, it's a strong card arguably the best creature of all time when it was first printed, and yes, it did see a ton of standard play and even some older format play back when it was first printed, but that's not the whole story. Look back on our list of most expensive cards over the last few years, most of them top out around $20 or $30. Bane Slayer was double that because it was a mythic rare. 2009 was the first year where the ultra rare mythics were printed, and it turns out that when a mythic becomes a tournament staple, the price can get extremely high because the supply of the card is lower than a normal rare, and this will be a recurring theme for the rest of our list. 2010, then Jace the Mind Sculptor from World Wake, $120. Now Mox Opal from Scars of Mirrodin, $77. The most shocking part of Mox Opal's $77 price tag is the cost is still that high, even though it was banned in Modern a few years ago. Otherwise, a Mox being extremely expensive is more or less par for the course for Magic. Back in 2010, though, it was a certain Planeswalker that was breaking the bank, and honestly, also the game, or at least standard, in Jace the Mind Sculptor. Without from Stoneforge Mystic, Jace created one of the most iconic and strongest standard decks of all time in Call Blade. The deck absolutely dominated standard at the time. If you're a newer Magic player, think back to how Oko Thief of Crowns dominated standard a few years ago. Jace did essentially the same thing a decade earlier, gaining its reputation as the best Planeswalker of all time. This dominance led to the price of the Mythic spiking to $120 at its peak, making Jace the first ever standard legal card to cost more than $100. In the end, it turns out that Jace wasn't just good, but it was too good. While Patrick Chapin's rap about Jace being better than all might seem like a meme today, At the time, it was actually true, and this forced Wizards to ban Jason Standard back during an era of the game where Standard bannings happened something like once a decade rather than every few months. 2011, then Sword of Feast and Famine from Mirrodin Besieged, $32. Now, Parallel Lives from Innistrad, $44. 2011 is a strange year. The most expensive card today is Parallel Lives, and Parallel Lives is essentially half of 2005's most expensive card doubling season. Meanwhile, the most expensive card back in 2011 was sort of Feast and Famine, a new addition to the cycle started by 2003's most expensive card, sort of Fire and Ice, at $32. While many things have changed in Magic over the past 30 years, one thing that apparently hasn't is that token doublers and swords always end up being ridiculously expensive. 2012, then Thundermaw Halkite from Corset 2013, $32. Now Cavern of Souls from Avenson Restored, $50. It was clear that Cavern of Souls would be a chase expensive card from the minute it was previewed. Fixing your mana 
and making your creatures uncounterable is exactly what tribal decks in every format wants, which is why the effect still costs $50 even though it constantly gets reprinted. At the time though, Thundermaw Hellkite was even more expensive. Coming in at $32 is one of the best mid-range threats in finishers in standard. Remember Goldspan Dragon spiking in price a couple of years ago thanks to its standard dominance? Thundermaw Hellkite was basically the 2012 version of Goldspan Dragon. Coming down with haste to smack opponents for five while also pinging and tapping down opposing flyers, which was especially important due to Lingering Souls being a staple in the standard format. 2013, then True Name Nemesis from Commander 2013, $45. Now, Nykthos Shrine of Nyx from Theros, $32. I think there's a pretty strong argument that Nykthos is the strongest land printed during the past decade of Magic. In general, lands that tap for tons of mana are relics from the earliest days of Magic. Think about Cabal Coffers, Telerian Academy, Gaia's Cradle. The one exception is Nykthos. Designed to support the devotion theme of Theros, the land quickly became one of the best cards in Standard and still sees heavy play in Commander and Pioneer. However, Nykthos was just a rare. So while it was legal and standard, it only cost around $10, which allowed a Commander Precon card to sneak in and steal the title of most expensive card of the year in True Name Nemesis. Well, it's true that True Name Nemesis was technically printed in a Commander Precon, the reason it spiked up to $45 wasn't Commander, it's that it quickly emerged as a legacy staple. Giving protection from an opponent is pretty medium in a four player format like Commander because one of your other opponents can still kill your True Name, but in a 1v1 format it's sort of absurd, essentially offering you a 3 mana version of Progenitus. At the time, Commander Precons cost around $30, but True Name Nemesis itself was selling for $45, which meant it was actually profitable to buy the Precon deck, sell the True Name Nemesis, and keep the rest of the cards, which quickly led to the Mind Seas Commander Precon being sold out pretty much anywhere, because even if you didn't want the deck, it was just correct to buy it as a way to make a few dollars easily. This led to some big problems because of the way Commander Precons are printed. Game stores can only buy the decks in sets, getting one copy of each deck, but only the True Name Nemesis deck was selling, so stores were afraid to order more of them or else they'd get stuck with all the other decks that no one actually wanted. Thankfully, Wizards eventually changed this rule and made it so stores could essentially just order more of the True Name Nemesis deck, which finally solved the price problem and allowed players to access the deck. 2014, then Brimas King of Oreskos from Born of the Gods, $25. Now, Sliver Hive from Corset 2015, $34. Just a few weeks ago, Sliver Hive was $10, but after Wizards, for a reason no one can actually figure out, decided not to reprint the land in its super obvious home in the Commander Master Sliver Precon deck, it spiked up over $30, making it the most expensive card of its year. However, back in 2014, it was standard staple and sometimes modern playable Brim as King of Oreskos on top at $25. A 3 minute 3 4 is a solid stat line, and thanks to the cat token Brim as makes when it attacks or blocks, it's really more of a a 3 mana 4 or 5 which made it a staple in basically any deck playing white which drove up its price. 2015 then Jace Friends Prodigy from Magic Origins $92, now Arachnogenesis from Commander 2015 $44. Thanks to the recent printing of Shelob, Spiderfrog Arachnogenesis from Commander 2015 costs a massive $44, although hopefully this will be changed soon as the Commander Masters reprint hits the market, although this pales in comparison to the most expensive card back in 2015, Jace Friends Prodigy. Five years after Jace the Mind Sculptor broke the $100 price mark, Flip Jace gave the OG Jace a run for its money, coming in just under $100 at its peak, which led to one of the most expensive standard formats in the history of the game, with the cost of a tier deck rising to nearly $1,000. A quick honorable mention to the Battle for Zendikar Expeditions. The ultra rare lottery cards don't technically qualify for our list.
list because they're all reprints, although they did show up on very rare occasions in Battle for Zendikar booster packs. In the most expensive of the expeditions, the Fetchlands and Ancient Tomb currently cost between $250 and $300. 2016, then Leovold Emissary of Trust from Conspiracy $60. Now, Emrakul the Promised End from Eldritch Moon $70. $7. While Little Emrakul might not be as powerful as Big Emrakul, today it's even more expensive in part because it's actually legal in Commander coming in at a massive $77. Back in 2016 though, the most expensive card didn't come from a standard set. Instead it came from Conspiracy and Leovold Emissary of Trust, which at one point spiked all the way up to $60. The 3-drop immediately became a staple in both Legacy and Commander thanks to its ability to stop opponents from drawing cards, combo with wields, and even protect your team from removal by allowing you to draw a card if your opponent targets your stuff, although its reign was relatively short-lived. Due to metagame shifts in Legacy, its impact was muted and it ended up being banned in Commander. This combined with an Ultimate Masters reprinting has dropped its price all the way down to $3. 2017, then the Scarab God from Hour of Devastation, $48. Now, Anointed Procession from Amonkhet, $40. Another twist on 2005's doubling season tops the current price list for 2017 in Anointed Procession, which is essentially 2011's Parallel Lives, but color shifted to white. And another round of lottery cards, the Amonkhet Invocations, headlined by a $170 Force of Will, are also super expensive. But as far as non-reprinted cards from 2017, nothing tops the Scarab God. The Mythic God not only found itself to be a standard staple, but it's a popular commander and even saw some play in modern back in the day, which pushed its price up to $50 at its peak, letting it top Hazareth the Fervent is the most expensive card of the year. 2018, then Teferi Hero of Dominaria from Dominaria, $52. Now, Resplendent Angel from Corset 2019, $33. Here we finally start to see the impact of Magic's newest competitive format, Pioneer. While Resplendent Angel is a member of a fan favorite tribe in Angels, and it does show up in Casual Life Game decks, it wasn't until Selesnya Angels emerged as a real deck in Pioneer that the Angels shot up from around $10 to its current $33 price tag. At the time though, back in 2018, the most expensive card in Magic was decidedly less FUD, to very Hero of Dominaria. The 5 mana Planeswalker's ability to untap lands to let its controller leave up instant speed interaction removal encounters almost immediately made it a control staple as soon as it was printed from standard all the way back to legacy. In conjunction with extra turn spell Nexus of Fate, it helped create one of the most miserable standard archetypes of its era. Once players figured out that you could use Teferi's negative 3 ability to tuck itself back into your library, which would keep you from ever milling out. So rather than actually needing to kill your opponent, you could just take a bunch of extra turns. Eventually, you'd ultimate your Teferi so you could exile all of your opponent's permanents. And if your poor opponent refused to scoop up the game and concede, eventually they would draw their entire deck and lose to milling out as you just repeatedly tucked Teferi back into your deck so you'd never run out of cards. While paying $52 for a standard card is rough, playing against Teferi in standard was far far rougher. 2019, then Renin 6 from Modern Horizons, $100. Now, Dockside Extortion is from Commander 2019 at $55. Apparently 2019 was the year of the supplemental product. The current most expensive card from the year is everyone's favorite goblin pirate Dockside Extortionist, with a commander stable costing a whopping $55 thanks to its ability to generate an absurd of 
massive amount of mana and treasure tokens and sometimes almost accidentally go infinite. Meanwhile, back in 2019, it was Modern Horizons, the first set ever printed directly into Modern, that was driving up prices with the Planeswalker Ren and Six peaking at a massive $100. Over the next couple of years, the two drops playability and price continued to climb, at one point reaching $130 before Wizards took action and reprinted it in Double Masters 2022, which managed to drop Ren and Six costs down to a still very expensive but somewhat more palatable 45 bucks. 2020, then, Allosaurus Shepherd from Jumpstar, $139. Now, Jewel Lotus from Commander Legends, $77. What Ren and Six did to Modern, Jeweled Lotus did to Commander in 2020's Commander Legends, a set that was designed to print a bunch of powerful cards directly into the Commander format. The end result was a Mythic Black Lotus for Commanders, which today still costs around $80 despite the fact it was just reprinted in Commander Masters. Meanwhile, 2020 was the year of the pandemic disrupting magic print runs. Wizards had a fun idea to make a set called Jumpstart that was supposed to be a super casual new player product, where you could just open two booster packs, shuffle them together, and play a game of magic. But to actually sell the product, Wizards decided to include a couple of super push constructed staples in Muxus Goblin Grande and Allosaurus Shepherd. This would have been alright, except disruptions from the pandemic greatly reduced the supply of Jumpstart, which led to Allosaurus Shepherd, a new staple in Legacy and Commander Elf decks, climbing to absurd prices. By August of 2020, just a few months after Jumpstart released, Allosaurus Shepherd cost $139, and by April of 2021, it peaked at an insane $220 before Wizards finally managed to get another print run of Jumpstart on the market. This, combined with a Double Masters 2022 reprinting, managed to get the cost of the Elf Shaman down to a more reasonable $22. 2021, then Raghavan Nimble Pilfer from Modern Horizons 2, $95, now Raghavan Nimble Pilfer from Modern Horizons 2, $47. 2021 is a easy year. For the first time since Black Lotus back in 1993, the most expensive card today was also the most expensive card back in 2021. Although I guess this isn't saying much considering 2021 just ended, what, 19 months ago? So what beloved card commands such a massive price tag? It's the stupid monkey Raghavan of a nimble pilfer. Printed with the intention to be one of the best cards in modern, it lived up to its goal, quickly becoming one of the most played and in some ways most obnoxious creatures in the format, as a savannah lions that can snowball into a win all by itself by drawing cards and producing treasures. Today, thanks in part to a reprinting and in part due to Orcish Bowmasters being very good at killing Raghavan, its price is down to $47 after peaking at around $100 back in 2021 right after a release. Least. 2022. Then she ordered the apocalypse from Dominaire United $35. Now she ordered at $72. Shielded is a lot like Raghavan, the most expensive card of the year when it was first printed, and the most expensive card today, except it's standard legal, and rather than decreasing in price, it's actually been increasing in price. Back when Shieldred first released, it certainly wasn't cheap, but you could snag copies for around $35. But over the past year, it has more than doubled in price up to $72. Why such a big price increase? Well, it turns out Shieldred is the best and most heavily played creature in standard, sees a ton of play in Pioneer and Modern, and is also a legit commander staple. When a mythic rare that's also an iconic character in the game's history happens to see play across formats, it's gonna end up getting pretty pricey. Somehow, even though Shieldred is less than a year old, we already desperately need a reprint. 2023, The One Ring from Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth. 
two million dollars. If you had told a Magic player a year ago that a newly printed card would be worth more than Black Lotus, they would have straight up laughed in your face. It just didn't seem possible. But that was before Wizards of the Coast announced they'd be printing a serialized one of one version of the One Ring in Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle Earth. Once the set dropped, players spent a couple of weeks frantically cracking packs to try to find the card, and once it was opened, it was quickly sold to Post Malone for a record shattering price of two million dollars. What is a purchase you blew too much money on and regret? Regret? Mm -hmm. <sighs> or you blew too much money on and you're aware, but you don't give a. I bought the Lord of the Rings magic card. Oh, do you want to tell me how much that was? It was $2 million. While it may have taken 30 years, the most iconic franchise in the history of fantasy coming to Magic for the first time, and honestly a bit of a gimmick with the serialized one of one thing, what this means is a Magic card has finally toppled the iconic Black Lotus for title of most expensive card in the game. Something that, just a few months ago, seemed completely unbelievable. Looking for even more magic? Well, check out the video where we talk about the fastest bannings in the history of the game. Or maybe the one where we talk about the most hated card from every single year of Magic the Gathering.